John, I just wanted to let you know that the majority of the women are single women who would very much like to be in a committed, loving relationship with a great guy. And so many of the women here are successful and happy in other aspects of their lives, but are feeling frustrated, disappointed, or disillusioned about their love lives. And I wonder what advice you would offer to a woman who feels this way. Well, one of the biggest challenges today for women is finding a balance within themselves of what we can call the Mars and Venus sides, the masculine energies and the feminine energies. And by that, when I talked about this 20 years ago, that was rather abstract for some people. But now it's very concrete because we're really talking about aspects of who we are according to how our brains are different, different parts of our brain, accessing different parts of our brain, and being under the influence of certain hormonal balance states. So let's say when, you're more, when your testosterone levels are higher, you're more in your masculine energies. That's being goal-oriented, that's being uh, assertive, uh, that's being uh, basically problem-solving all the time. And this mm-hmm. is what I see happening for women a lot is they tend to uh, go too far to their masculine side and neglect their feminine side and that has more to do with the relationship as- aspect. There's one, the task-oriented aspect of life, solving problems, making money, fixing things, getting things done. And then the other side of life is the quality of relationships. What do you think? What do I think? How do I feel? How do you feel? What are you wearing today? What are you eating today? It's a more nurturing side of who we are. <clears throat> and this is these are biological differences between men and women in that Men become more stressed when they are experiencing more of the female hormones, and women become more stressed when they're experiencing more of the masculine hormones. It's not that masculine hormones are bad for women. It's just that if you go out of balance, then your stress levels go up. Your mood is affected. Your sense of well-being is affected. Your ability to appreciate what you have in the moment is diminished when you're Your body's not making the proper balance of female hormones, which according to what stage of life you're at, that will change. But we're talking about estrogen and progesterone levels, the balance between those two hormones. And we're also talking about a very important hormone, uh, which affects women's well-being, which is called oxytocin. And oxytocin is the hormone that combined with estrogen that makes women exude a, a a presence of self-assuredness, an appreciation for what is in front of them, a sense of grace, a sense of love, a radiance. And whenever a woman is radiating love, she is attracting particularly the right man to her. So there's there's actually a biological basis of being attractive. You know, men don't figure out who am I most attracted to. Certainly we're kind of hypnotized by the media as to what the right woman looks like. But that right. that's dispelled very quickly. It's the actual woman being authentic will attract certain men, the right men, into her life. And that has a hormonal balance as well. Hmm. Do you feel like this this tendency for women to get a little more into the masculine side is in part because of so many women being out there in their careers and perhaps they have to operate a little bit more in what might feel like or seem like their masculine energy there. And while that might work well there, it doesn't translate as well into their interpersonal relationships. Well, that's a very profound statement. I mean, it really is true, is that when you're very good at getting things done on your own, you have a strong sense of self-sufficiency and independence. That ability to feel fulfilled and be independent can also be repellent to a man who's willing to make a commitment, who has a sense of security. It can be very attractive to men who feel insecure. Well, here's an independent woman. You know, I don't have to work hard to make her happy. Uh, But these men typically don't commit. They tend to, and also after a while, women are not attracted to them either because there's a sense of insecurity and neediness that he exhibits. He'll tend to be attracted to an independent woman. And so... It's nothing wrong with being independent as long as it is balanced by a part of you that's in touch with the ability to appreciate having a man in your life. So let's uh, let's say analyze the that feeling of appreciation. You could 
you could prefer to go left as opposed to going right, and you'd appreciate that opportunity. If you really, really want to go left and right, then you're really going to appreciate that. And if you need something, you appreciate it even more. And this is the aspect that goes along with estrogen. Estrogen gets us in touch with what we need. As a matter of fact, when estrogen levels naturally reach their peak during a woman's cycling, that's when she finds men most attractive. And that's when men find her most attractive. That's at a time of, of, of fertility for her. Basically, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. It's a cycle. But that consciousness that goes along with feeling vulnerable, which means that I depend on others, I need others, it's deeper than I would like to be with a man. It would be nice to have a man in my life. Wouldn't that be fun to have a man in my life? As opposed to being in touch with a part of us that needs love. We all need love. And men need love too. Women need love. It's just that women, due to their hormonal nature, have the potential to be more aware of the feeling of that need for love. And when they're feeling that need for love, and at the same time they're feeling assured that they can get the love they need, that would be more their independent side, balancing it, then they become most attractive to men. And I understand as I express this, that's very confusing to many women because... Mm -hmm. Neediness is a turnoff to women, and it's a huge turnoff to men as well. Uh, it, nobody wants to be really in a relationship with some, somebody who's too needy. But needing someone is different from needy. When you need something and you get it, you're really, really happy. There's this wave of happiness that you have. So to be in touch with your needs is to be in touch actually with the feminine side of you. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're needy. If you're only in touch with the female side, then you're going to be needy because you feel powerless to get what you need. So there's a balance that we have to strike. And it's more, more difficult today than ever before in history. And the reason for that, we can look at a lot of sociological reasons, one simply being that women have the opportunities to be more expressive of their masculine side. They can be more independent and so forth according to society. And two, society encourages that. And our society today often values masculine activities more than feminine activities. So those are, those are sort of the mundane pressures to be more masculine for women. But there's another reason for that too, is that there's a, there's a shift in consciousness, uh, really an elevation of consciousness, a higher consciousness that we have the potential to access today. Uh, there could be many, many reasons for it. But the reality is, you know, I have grandchildren. They're much brighter and smarter than, than I was when I was growing up. My children were. There's just a greater awareness that we have today, greater knowledge, greater consciousness, greater awareness, greater potential for that. And you could look at that in terms of a spiritual consciousness because as spirits, we're not masculine or feminine. But we're in these bodies that have masculine and feminine hormones and brain differences and so forth. And we have to respect the body. But at the same time, on a level of consciousness, we are both masculine and feminine. So in a sense, we're perfectly androgynous in our spiritual self. One aspect of who we are is masculine and feminine. And now we have a society that allows us to be more whole. And so the, and, and women are encouraged to be more whole. It's just that encouragement tends to push them too far to expressing the masculine and it doesn't support the feminine as well. And I think part of my whole message, which has been so helpful for men to understand women and for women to understand men, is to define very clearly those two sides of us so that we can be supportive of both sides and make sure that somebody doesn't get left out. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it's so important what you said when you made the distinction between need and needy because there are so many women out there that I speak with that almost say with pride, I don't need a man. And it's almost like they've worked so hard for that independence and that strength that they almost feel like expressing that need uh, would be a sign of weakness. Yeah, and, and ironically, being in touch with need, your needs is 
is being in touch with femininity. And being in touch with your desires, what you want is masculinity. Okay, I want to achieve this goal. I want to get this done. I want this to change. I want to fix this. So we have to find a balance in those two aspects of who we are. It's subtle. And then there's there's the place in between, which is preference, which is what I like, what I enjoy. But the depth of femininity is being in touch with the... When you really need something, you value it. You give it importance. It has a big place in your life. And so what you do is you tend to value relationship and the time spent to create relationship. That becomes a very important element to attract a man into your life. You know, many women I, I help will have helped. You know, you, you basically, how much time do you have for a relationship in your life? They're so busy in their career that there really isn't that much time in their relationship. That's one, uh, to have a relationship. And two is they don't focus on the quality of relationships, like friendships, having lots of other friendships, a social life which is rich and fulfilling, separate from their work life, which can also be rich and fulfilling, but it does trigger different kinds of hormones. It triggers hormones of independence, self-reliance, and and you know competence and so forth and those are all good that tends to be linked to testosterone and and just as a little note one of the differences between the male physiology and the female physiology while well, there are many many one of them which is very significant is your average male has 30 times more testosterone than women and it's testosterone which is the hormone that helps lower stress in a man's body the hormone that lowers stress in a woman's body is oxytocin now, why is lowering stress so important if you're looking to have a long-lasting, loving relationship? Is that when women have lots of oxytocin in their body, their body is producing massive amounts of pheromones, which makes them very attractive. Pheromones is a, is a, a scent that you don't consciously smell, but you know men have a little uh, extra two flaps up in the top of their nose just to detect pheromones, which creates a, a sexual attraction, a sexual interest in women and of course mm-hmm. one of the one of the differences between men and women is that women generally feel an attraction mentally you know like this man is curious he's interesting to me i find him someone i admire i'd like to get to know him that is quite often when you have those kind of feelings you're 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 feeling attracted to the right guy for a man there's always this immediate awareness that oh this is somebody I could be sexually attracted to. It's like men start down south and go north. Women start north and go south. And for many women who I've counseled who who have said to me, why is it that every man I get involved with is either married, it finds out he's married, or he's not available, he has some big problem, he doesn't want to make commitments. It's because there's a part of us that can intuitively sense quite often the availability of a partner. And when a man is not available, it can trigger sexual feelings inside of a woman, as opposed to when a man is available, it doesn't immediately trigger sexual feelings. Now, this isn't always the case, hmm. but but if it's been your history that you find that you get turned on to a man, and then it's only a one-night stand, or you get turned on to a man, you find that he's really not available for a relationship with you, or he's always the wrong guy, or he doesn't call back, that means that you're getting turned on to guys that are not available. That's a signal. Don't go out with guys if you feel turned on to them right away. (laughs) And run the other direction. (laughs) Because it's also an indication in psychology, we might say, that there's an issue of unresolved issues with daddy or with a male figure, whereas a part of you is still seeking to find completeness by winning over the love of someone who wasn't available to you. And, And so that can create a sense of, I have to do something, be something different to get love, as opposed to finding a man who actually wants to be something different and do something different to win your love. See, that's very healthy in men. That's what pulls men out of themselves to become better. It's literally, and from this perspective, it's a man wanting to provide for a woman that gives him meaning in life, gives him purpose in life, that motivates him to be a better person, to succeed in providing a greater level of happiness for her. That's a very healthy thing for men, not a healthy thing for women. 
women's primarily motive in a relationship is to find somebody who makes her feel safe to be herself, someone who provides a, some form of support, self-motivated form of support to provide uh, safety and happiness for her. That's the best motive coming from a man. But for women, it should be seeking out the man who's willing to do that for you, not finding a man that you have to do that for. So to yes, summarize I'm... that, it's a little complicated, but to summarize that, I, I basically help people understand that bonding between men and women occurs differently for men than for women. Men bond with a woman. That means I want to be with her. I miss her. I want to be in a relationship with her. I'm growing closer with her. She's the one for me. I want to make a commitment to her. Bonding occurs through a process in men of being attracted to her, doing something that provides fulfillment for her, feeling successful. The more men go through that process of feeling successful and providing something for her of meaning and of value, he bonds with her. Now, let's say a man's in a relationship and she's doing for him and she's providing value for him and she's calling him up and making the date and planning the thing and offering this and offering that and giving him whatever he wants, so to speak. That puts a man in a passive mode. In a sense, she's too easy. He doesn't bond with her because he hasn't earned her love. He hasn't done something. He hasn't accomplished. Because men particularly bond by feeling successful. Now, every man knows that if if I'm playing tennis with a friend and he lets me win, I don't really feel successful. I might have won, but I don't feel successful. Men need to feel they earn it because whenever you're earning something, testosterone gets produced. And it's testosterone is the hormone that makes men want to bond, that allows a man to bond with a woman, that makes him more interested in her and a sustained relationship. So the art of attracting the right man is giving out messages and being ready for the man, is being in a place where you can give the right messages that say to a man, he can be successful in making you happier. He's not responsible to make you happy. He can make you happier. So that's a distinction there. You know, the, the sort of dysfunctional relationship is the guy who comes and rescues a woman who's unhappy <clears throat> that before she meets him. Then when she falls back into that place of unhappy, many times he gives up. But when a woman has the enough ability to find happiness within herself, then she's the fertile ground for a man to make her happier, make her happier. And it's that place of success that helps a man bond with a woman. Now, turn this around, and from the woman's point of view, she bonds with a man. She will grow in love with a man when a man is successful in meeting her needs, when a man is successful in providing what is most important to her, when he is there for her. <coughs> That's what causes a woman to bond to a man. And you just have to flip that around, and it's really just the opposite for men. So the good news here is this should help clarify some of the challenges that you've experienced in the past with men. Because often, if you're more on your masculine side and something goes wrong, you try harder next time and you want to give more and give more and give more. And what women don't realize is that, unlike unlike men... If you give more, unlike women, men are different. When you give more to a man, he tends to give less to you. If a man gives more to a woman, in certain circumstances, she feels, I want to give more back to him. If a man, Mm -hmm. but there's a reality, and this is sometimes the case. Some men come to me and say, you know, I do everything right. I do everything perfect, and she's not interested in me anymore. And I go, well, what do you do? And he's like, he becomes Mr. Talkative. He he complains about things. <laughs> he, he thinks what women want is more conversation. So he's like Mr. Talkative. He complains. He's Mr. Needy. And he's very picky. He's very controlling. But he does also all the other things. He does the romantic things and so forth. But what women, women want and need romance, but they don't need a man to be a girlfriend. There needs to be this sense that he is primarily there for her And she doesn't have to be there for all his problems and so forth, which these men will tend to assume is what women want. And it's not what women want. 
And, and, and quite often, if you're a strong, independent woman, the guys who are attracted to you are these needy, sensitive guys that will sometimes drive you crazy. Yeah. In fact, I'm so glad that you spoke about this idea because I think this is an area where many women have a lot of confusion and wonder if they do need to give more. And I noticed when I read your life story on your website, MarsVenus.com, one of the things that you said was, women should not get lost in trying to earn a man's love he should do things to win her over. And I think what you're saying here is if a woman is working too hard at it, she can actually take away a man's motivation, right? Nicely said. Well, you found the perfect quote to summarize what I was saying. Thank you. That was yeah. really, really, that's such well, a Well, that's really from key, you, so thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a key, key point. If, if here I sit back as a therapist and watch relationships, and hear relationships that go south, Almost always there's a level of resentment that the woman has from giving more and not getting back. And there's a level of resentment in the man which comes from giving and not feeling valued and appreciated for what he gives. So from his point of view, (coughs) he's feeling she looks at him and says, you're not enough. What you do is not enough. You have to change because it's not enough. And that builds resentment in him. And that's his resentment to her is that she's saying you're not enough. And her resentment is she is saying he's not enough. He's not not doing enough compared to how much she's giving. So that's that's the dynamic of where women can find their control in this, which is regulate how much you give to somebody. Don't give them more than they're giving to you. It's a little dance, and it's the opposite you know, the golden rule, which is give unto others what you would want them to give unto you. That's a beautiful rule and sentiment, you know, give love, but you have to find the way of giving that works for the other person. So let me try mm-hmm. to make this real concrete for a woman on a date with a guy. Okay, so oh, how would you... wonderful. Yeah, how would you apply this sort of philosophical ideas that we're talking about here? Is on a date, you know, but basically what you would do is make sure that the guy never talks more than you do. Okay, you can you can talk more than him. That's fine. Make sure that he doesn't talk more. Cuz if he's talking all the time, he doesn't bond with you. He doesn't get to connect with you. And also, you feel like he's not connecting with you either. So just don't feel obligated. But if you're following the golden rule and you're giving to him what you want, well, you want him to hear you and be interested in you. So you're going to take time to listen and be interested in him. You're going to ask him more questions and more questions. But a part of you is really wanting him to also ask you questions, to get to know you. And he's not going to do that. He'll just keep talking about him. And he will not bond with you, and you will not bond with him. And so it kind of goes south. That's one aspect of that's something you can regulate. Just make sure that you don't encourage him by asking questions to talk more. And when he finishes a sentence, then go off and talk about something else or talk about what he just said. But here's the way to talk about what he said. Is These are three phrases that will transform your dating experience, your courting experience, your marriage experience, your life experience with men, and you should apply them today. Just even doing these three simple things in the context of a lot of what we're learning here. But it's an anchor into coming back to you, to finding the femininity in you and awakening the masculinity in men. Because it's only when a man's masculine energies come forth that he's willing to show up and make a commitment. When men go to their female side, ironically, they're, they're not really good at making a commitment. They, they want people to do things for them as opposed to feeling that, you know, I stand for you. So the... To bring him to rise a man's testosterone, and you know, in the past, it's sort of been derogatory in a derogative way. It's been called stroking his ego, but actually, mm-hmm. it's basically supporting him, giving love to him in a way that works best for him, and that means it's going to trigger and raise the testosterone that makes him feel uh, more vibrant, healthier, uh, more love for self. Uh, his body has less stress, and so forth. So here's the three things. One is he's talking along, and you're just nodding your head. And, and before you shift the subject or talk about what he's saying, basically say, use the phrase, good idea. 
it's a simple phrase, but that's a <laughs> that's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> immediate, immediate, you'll watch, and you, you do this all the time with men in and, 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 and intimate relationships and work relationships. If you just say to a guy, whenever you truly feel it, that's a good idea. Well, that's a good idea. Because, you know, you can be going along in a conversation and think that's a good idea, but not realize how valuable it is to say that out loud. The flip side of this is what I tell men all the time, which is, Married men, I'll say, you know, you love her. Why don't you tell her you love her? And say, well, she should already know. And I said, no, just tell her you love her. Several times a day, I love you, honey. It just makes a huge difference to say what's in there as opposed to just feel it or let or know that it's there. So here is your power, is the power of words and femininity. Because when you say that's a good idea, you're coming from this part of you that appreciates. And that's the female side of us. You know, one of the complaints women have about men is they really are lousy at appreciating others. Uh, I go to conferences all the time, and a large part of the time is spent with the women acknowledging all the people that put the conference together. And you'll see men, some men doing this, but most not. And it's because Mm -hmm. men live in a world of competition. You don't want to acknowledge somebody else or appreciate them because that means they're going to get the, the prize and not you. So there's always this sort of competitiveness that doesn't allow men to be as good at appreciating, but that ability to appreciate what you have, to appreciate what just happened, to give value to that, that is our feminine side. So whenever you say good idea, that little light can start to shine out of you of femininity. Okay, that's a, that's a good idea. And, and just even the tone of a woman's voice is magic to a man. Men can't give this to each other. We give other things to each other. We validate each other by being similar. But we can't get that spark of appreciation. We get that from a woman. And it's one of the reasons we're drawn to women is your power is to see the value in what we do. And how we're, now we're coming back to that concept we talked about earlier, which is needing a man. You know, it, I go out into the world and, and I'm paid for my services. But who pays me the most? The people who need me the most. The people who value what I do the most. That's what boosts testosterone, it boosts a man's self-esteem, and it makes a man feel loved is when there's a world that needs him. Now, you know that as women, instinctively, you know, women are born knowing, this is one of the differences between men and women, your genes, you're born with the knowing that you are needed. You don't need other people to point it out. This is why women tend to become overwhelmed. That This person needs me, this person needs me, this person needs me. That's mm-hmm. something that's a given for women. You don't realize men just sit around because nobody needs me. And that's the <laughs> major that's the major cause of depression in men is when, when men basically whenever they're depressed they're out of work or they feel like nobody needs them. And and for women, they're depressed when they feel that not that nobody needs them, but that everybody needs them but nobody gives to them what they need that they feel alone. And that's a big thing that you have to watch out with that being independent. It's when you feel alone that you're there for everybody and nobody's there for you, it's very hard to make the hormone oxytocin that lowers stress for women and it becomes a precursor for depression, which is feeling like, oh, I'm there for everybody else, but why is it people there for me? Well, that just means that, okay, I need to start learning how to ask for support and being in a place to let people be there for me. And that's a challenge. That's learning how to be feminine, connecting to the feminine side. So the first step, and you will have fun with this because you'll see the power in it as well. It's actually an empowerment of the feminine side of us, not the empowerment of the masculine. The empowerment of the feminine is to motivate others, to raise up others, to inspire others, to bring forth others to support you. And that's another power. That's feminine power. And so this female power, you'll, you'll be wielding it wherever you go when you say to a guy, that's a good idea, and then talk a little bit about it. And the, another, the next phrase is, well, that makes sense. Kind of like, oh, you just put it together. Oh, that makes sense. And, and mm. the, mas- the masculine side of a woman might be afraid to even say that because it's competing. And you might be thinking, well, if I say that makes sense and I'm appreciating him, uh, <laughs> then I'm building him up. But that's not what happens. That happens between men and men. But when a woman says that that makes sense, a guy goes, okay, she's on my side. You know, she's somebody I want to support back. Even the most competitive work world, you know, you'll, you'll see many, many women who've made it through the glass ceiling. They they're, they're got there. Uh, by befriending men 
and it's often because they're able to, you know, acknowledge those men in a non-competitive way. It's a power that women that women can have, and on, from coming from the pure feminine, which is able to say that's a good idea, or that makes sense. And the third, which you just have fun with this, is wow, you're right. And you don't have to put the wow there, but that's that's more expressing that <laughs> feminine emotion, which is you're right. And a guy, you watch him, watch his posture. He's going to go. He'll he'll pause. He'll reflect on what he just said. He'll get a little closer to you. And, and this is the dance of, of bringing bringing men into your life and connecting to your feminine. When you're connecting to your feminine, then you're putting out. A presence which is drawing men in rather than pursuing men. Because that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to go after men. You want to, uh, what I call in my book, uh, Mars Venus on a Date, which could be helpful as well. I talk about stages of dating and different strategies and so forth, but the, which is I've been talking about now. It's called proceptivity. You know, we, we know to be proactive is to think ahead to take action. Well, proceptivity is, is what you can do to be receptive, okay? So it's a being uh, receptive to man. So it's letting him know in various, uh, almost indirect ways that if he was to take action, he would be uh, appreciated, that he would be welcome. It's almost like an uh, 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 exaggerated version of it is the, in a movie I saw once, the, uh, the guy and the girl are standing at the door after a date and she's looking at him, he's looking at her and she's, kind of looking up to him to let him know that you can make the move for the kiss but he's a shy guy and doesn't make that move <laughs> and so she says to him you know i just want you to know if you were to kiss me it would be okay <laughs> that's being proceptive <laughs> I, instead of kissing him let him know that if he kissed you it would be okay and it, there's a, a very delicate dance there and, and a way a metaphor to describe that is to think of at least in this situation we're talking about the balance of masculine and feminine, to think of the man as the sun and the woman as the moon, in that when you give, only give what the reflection is. As he moves to you, you move to him. As he moves to you, you move to him. And in this day and age where men are more feminine, because they're spiritual beings as well, so they have access to both their masculine and feminine, so a lot of men who have become more spiritual, more conscious, they tend to easily go off to their female side. They're going to be more shy, more indirect, and you do have to sort of give them clearer messages uh, that if they were to take steps towards you, uh, that they would be welcome. Men do not always get your signals, so you have to be a little louder in the signals. And, of course, with some men, you have to tone down the signals because they think if you just look their direction that you're inviting them to sleep with them or something. Mm -hmm. So it's a confusing world today, clearly, and as I mentioned before, and I want to emphasize this again, if your dating experience in the past has been men who do not commit, and you notice that your pattern is that you date men who turn you on right from the beginning, I mean physically turn you on towards the beginning, then as an experiment, try dating men that don't turn you on in the beginning, but who are, who are interested in you who are motivated to be with you, that you don't have to do anything to convince them they're after you. And they eventually, it, it can happen. I hear this story again and again from women that just it just happens where suddenly you become turned on to him physically when you weren't turned on necessarily before. And it's because of the nice things he did for you and his attention and his presence and so forth. So let love find its way and not always knowing right away if this is the person for you. For a man, he typically knows right away, instantly, if he could have sex with a woman. And that's always a prerequisite, which is, is there that sexual uh, potential? Having, having had that, he could go off and have sex with you, but that doesn't mean he wants to have a relationship with you. And this is often confusing for many women because they feel if they have sex with somebody that it's only going to be somebody that have some level of interest in having a relationship. Now, to backtrack... Right to backtrack with a man, while he's turned on to you, he is interested in having a relationship. And that's sort of the, the drug effect of being turned on. You're in an altered state when you're turned on. And so when you're turned on, there is this inkling of, well, maybe I want to have a relationship with her. I'm not against having a relationship with her. But then once that, uh, that sexual tension is released, there may be nothing. 
and because it never had a chance to develop. And this is the the, the this is the potential tragedy of having sex right away. I don't want to say it's always this way, of course, but is that when men have sexual tension, they can feel all this affection and warmth and love and feel like, oh gosh, she's fantastic. But when the sexual tension is gone, the only way he connected with her was through sexual tension. So if you go slower in the whole dating process and don't rush right to sex, or at least going all the way with sex, what happens is he's forced to maintain that sexual tension for weeks. And over the time, he's, the sexual tension motivates him to do nice things and be connected and so forth. It just He feels like it. It's an automatic. He feels more affection and love and caring when the sexual tension is there. That that starts creating other pathways of connection to you in his brain. Literally, he's growing neural connectors of memories of, oh, I did that for her and she was so happy and, oh, we did that together. That was so much fun. So now he has all these new connections to you because once sex is over or sex has happened a few times and the sexual tension lessens, what is he connected to you for? The only way he connected to you was through sex. So you want to eventually give, in a sense, you don't fulfill the lower centers until he's connected to you from his heart and his mind. And for a woman, what I suggest is don't fulfill the, the first go for the higher centers. Don't go right to the sexual center at all, but find the guy that there isn't that sexual tension and experience the tension as sort of, the, of wanting to get to know him, having a sense of admiration, wanting to connect with him, feeling an affection towards him. So it goes from the mind to the heart and then to the to the sexual parts. That tends to be a, a slowing down the process of getting to know somebody before you actually get to know them physically. Mm. So, John, if I'm understanding you correctly, and I do think this is so important because there is so much confusion out there for women around this. And like you said, I think most women perceive that if they have sex with a man, that is going to form a connection and perhaps deepen the relationship, but I believe what you're saying is if that happens too soon, it can actually short-circuit him being able to bond with a woman perhaps on more of an emotional level and to have that experience of winning her heart or doing those things for her that will form a deeper bond and connection in other ways above and beyond the sexual experience. I completely agree with what you just said, and that's exactly what I'm leaning into. And I always hesitate to say, okay, is it three dates, is it ten dates, whatever it is. We really have to yeah. follow our heart. But the, the the dynamic here is look at your history, look at your patterns. Sometimes if you have a pattern, you have to willfully change it. So, And so if your pattern is having sex right away and men don't commit, then clearly that's a pattern you have to use some willpower to change. And uh, if... If you're in a relationship and a guy's pushing for sex and you just don't feel ready for that, please, please honor that. Because to have sex before every part of your body is wanting it is to do it for him. And the confusion there is some women don't know that they're wanting to have sex just to please him and get him. They don't realize that their desire for sex is, comes from a place of insecurity. And when it comes from a place of insecurity, and I'm going to say, do what he wants... Uh, it, it, it really is true. It's ironic that a guy will really be happy for a few moments, so to speak, but then he will like you less and his bond to you will be less than if he actually had to pursue, uh, have to do something to earn it, so to speak. And it's different, and to be quite honest as well, I think as we become older, uh, we become much more mature, so that process can be faster. But let's just say that you went on a you know, you're out on a date, and let's say you find your soul. Let's say it's a soulmate, somebody who could be the perfect person for you. And and then you have this romantic experience, and you make love that night, whatever. And let's say you realize, oh my God, I just got caught up into it. I really wasn't ready for it. It was too soon. Uh, and he's not calling back. He seems to be not interested. What happened? Can you salvage that? Yes, you can salvage that. It's not like it's a huge, huge mistake, although ideal to avoid. But you can basically, how do you approach the person later is you don't call them the next, after three days and get upset with them that you didn't call me back and I thought you said this, I thought you liked me, wasn't it wonderful, why didn't you call? Uh, 
typically men will get when men get close too fast, then they withdraw too far. And so once he's withdrawn, mm-hmm. then maybe it could be six days, a week later, he feels like he wants to give you a call and he's thinking, oh my God, she's going to be mad at me. And that causes him to even withdraw more. And, or it could even be a month or two later, he starts to feel like, gee, you know, I realize she really was special. I want to give her a call, but oh, she'll be so mad at me. So, and this really does happen. Guys will nod their head and they go, yeah, you know, uh, I don't want to hear hear all that I don't want to know that I hurt her and I don't want her to complain to me and and so literally it pushes them away and so what you can do is if you've if you've connected with a guy on a very intimate level and he hasn't contacted you or whatever and you'd like to contact him you can there's no rule against it as long as you don't get upset with him and as long as you don't push to see each other again but what you would do is kind of it's along the same lines of oh gosh I was thinking about you I went to see this movie it was wonderful thought we might have lunch together or maybe we can get together you know just want you to know I had a lovely time and if it, nothing pushy it's you'll have your own personality with these things but it should be authentic it should just be a, a call to connect and say something was wonderful about the date you know I didn't have a chance to tell you but I just that was such a great movie and it just sat so well with me it was a, it was just a delight to spend time with you. And that was it. You don't have to say, I love you, I like you, but the way you communicate to a guy that you have feelings for him is don't be so direct, but you can say, I had a great time, I had so much fun, you know, it was, it was just the best play I'd ever seen, it was such a nice time. When you talk about what the experience was, a man takes credit for it, so you get right to his heart. So these are all subtle messages I'm giving right now in terms of when you're on a date with a guy, how you experience the date, he's going to take credit for it. And women unknowingly, not knowing the differences between men and women, you could be, let's say you're at a restaurant with him, and let's compare it to going on a date with a guy and going on a a date with a girlfriend. You know, you're just going out with the girls and you go to a Chinese restaurant and the beans are too salty. So right. immediately the conversation is going to be, oh, my God, these beans are so salty. Are you salty? Yeah, mine are salty. I mean, I have such a better recipe for this. I can't believe they put so much salt. And look how much they charge for this. You know, why are so many people coming here anyway? I mean, I wouldn't tell anybody about that. It would be a whole conversation about salty beans, and all the women would bond and get closer. <laughs> so, right. So, so see, when you share problems, that's a big oxytocin producer amongst women. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. to a guy on a date, as soon as you say these beans are too salty, He's going to go, those are my beans. I cook those beans. You don't like my beans? You have to realize you're talking to the chef because particularly on a romantic date, a man takes credit for anything you experience. So on a romantic date, this is not life. You don't have to hide yourself in a relationship. But particularly in the dating stage, and if you're married, on the romantic dates, this is a time to only focus on the positive. After all, he's trying to put forth the most positive. She needs to put forth the most positive reactions to things. So to be conscious that talking about problems is not the thing to do on a romantic date, but simply talking about what's good and is what you focus on on a romantic date. And talking about what's good means anything that makes him feel smart, intelligent, brilliant, successful, and that you're having a good time. So I remember when I basically realized it was my wife Bonnie we've been married 30 years and when I realized this is the woman for me and I knew I wanted to marry her is I was taking her away on a little romantic getaway and we've been dating for quite a while and so forth but you know I didn't know if I want to marry her but I got lost on the way and ended up in Nevada when we were going to a place in California and we went over this line, and I was so embarrassed. I knew we were going to be late, and I'd been in other relationships for women where they'd be so upset that we're late, we're supposed to be there. And she didn't show any of that, but I pulled over to the side of the road to look at the map. I said, I think we're you know, going on the wrong road. And she basically was quiet for a moment, and she says, well, I don't know where we are either, but look at this sunset. It's the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. And in that moment, I went, yes, I created that sunset. This is designed just for you. (laughs) That's the feeling inside. But the real feeling inside, this is the woman I wanted to marry. And she, to this day, you know, she still does that. You know, she will look at the positive, particularly she'll sense at times where the negative is very obvious. 
and she'll point out the positive to let me know that, you know, she loves me in a sense. And and we all need that reassurance. Men need it in a different way. Women need it in a, in a different way. Hugs and affection and touch and eye contact and listening and giving reassurance and empathy as well as acknowledgement. You know, these are all things that, you know, a woman needs. Well, men need love too, but it often shows up in, in a way that says, you're a success, you can do it, you're a can-do person, and I appreciate you in my life. Mm. Yeah, that was really beautiful, beautifully said. So, John, I want to shift gears just a little bit and ask you a question, because I know many of the women have been through heartbreak, divorce, really difficult breakups, and are really afraid to open up their hearts or trust again. I just wonder if you could speak to that for a minute. Well, yes, I can. Well, not that you have to be a statistic, okay, but without help, we'll say it this way, women statistically, after a painful breakup, will will wait nine years before becoming involved again. And men, it can be much sooner, three years at the latest. And often a big blow to your heart is when you've been with a man and you see him getting involved with somebody right away then you kind of feel like, what, I was nothing to him? Because you're feeling such a loss, why doesn't he feel such a loss? Well, the feeling part of the brain is twice as big in women. And under moderate stress, women have eight times more blood flow to that emotional part of the brain. The right side of the brain, which has to do with loss and feelings and emotions, is always bigger in women compared to the left side, which is bigger in men, it's called the left interior parietal lobe. It's bigger in men, which has to do with solving problems and in personal interactions. So when a relationship breaks up, it's a problem, and the solution to being alone is to find somebody. So that's how men deal with loss. Is if you have, if you have a loss, then you have to solve the problem by doing something about it and going finding someone else. But for women, the healing process is different, and it has to do with you know, you're with somebody, you love them, how can I trust that I could be with the right person because I thought this was the right person? So what women do is they internalize it and put it on themselves and the the questioning becomes, well, you know, how can I trust myself to love again? And hopefully by educating yourself and some of the common mistakes both men and women make in relationships, uh, we can make sense of what happened. When you can make sense of what happened, then your trust levels can increase, which allows your oxytocin levels. Oxytocin is the hormone of trust. Oxytocin is that part of you that will bond with a man again. And so this is, you know, a, a big uh, a difference between men and women is there's a tendency, unless women get the support they need, they don't always move into another relationship. It's certainly possible. It's certainly available to you. The power is within you. It's finding that place again that's really open and ready for it. And we need help to get through those moments. Just like if you broke your arm, you, you wouldn't want to fix it all on your own. You want to get help to do it. Because often when we're alone and we feel you know not in relationships, we tend to attract other people who feel that way too, which reinforces what we're feeling rather than people who can validate what we're feeling, but who've moved beyond that to find love in their life. That's such a key component to having mentors and people who inspire us with the truth. Because it can happen, I see it happening all the time, particularly, I mean, one example is a woman came to me and we just processed her feelings of her dad and some of her feelings of past relationships. But most importantly, she said was, just understanding men, just being able to interpret men correctly and giving herself permission to be feminine and realize that's what's most attractive in a relationship with a man. You don't have to prove to him how confident you are. You have to be loving, and that's what allows men to fall in love with you. And then a few weeks later, literally, she meets the love of her life. This is what happens again and again, is when people go through processes of coming back to feeling their authentic self, then love happens. Uh, there's a, a movie right now called Wild, and you know the woman that went into the wild and took this. She was just bottomed out in life, but she was in nature, and you know, and she basically felt when you're in nature all alone for weeks, you feel your need, your need for life and love and nature and all that. Uh, then eight days later, she meets a guy and she's happily married and has a family. So connecting back to that need, that vulnerable place, is what makes it shifts your awareness to where you're able to see 
the right person for you, and they're able to see that you're the right person for them. Uh, so that's really, really a key thing. You know, when as the time passes and I see our time together is is closing, I, I want to mention something about my most recent work, which has really taken me about 10 years to put together. Because uh, while it's not a behavioral aspect, it's a biological aspect of being able to be ready for the right person for you. And that's to realize that today we tend to be highly stressed, and I talked about the reason for that is being more on the masculine side for women. And But there's also an aspect of our diet and exercise and lifestyle choices, which I talk about in my book, Staying Focused in a Hyper World. And that is natural solutions, which is we, we need to understand that our high-carbohydrate diet, for example, sugar, junk foods, addictions, and so forth, uh, what they do is they, they overstimulate the brain and they keep, create a kind of hyper state. Uh, for children, it looks like ADHD, but for grown women, it often looks like feeling overwhelmed and disconnected from their feminine energy. They're so much into the masculine energy of having to do, having to do, having to do, they're not able to reconnect back to the feminine. So if you find you're having difficulty sleeping, your mind is really, really racing and busy, there's lots of natural solutions that can support these behaviors that I've been talking about. In addition, there's behaviors to stimulate more oxy, oxytocin in your life, and I've written about that in many, many of my books. But basically, you've got to balance a life that's working hard with a life where you're enjoying yourself. That's what produces the oxytocin that attracts the right man. And major oxytocin producers are going, getting your hair done, getting massage, uh, going for lunches and not talking about business, going for walks in nature, uh, uh, going shopping when you're not in a hurry, uh, doing things that make you feel beautiful. These are all things, quote, girly things, not practical things to make money, but things that you enjoy doing when you're not rushed. Those are all oxytocin activities. And then there's actual supplements that will create more oxytocin, depending upon what your health challenges are. And I talk about that in my book. But the biggest supplement that I've found to create oxytocin is low-dose lithium orotate and uh, minerals, but uh, the most important is lithium. And lithium is misunderstood because it's prescribed by psychiatrists, by people with bipolar mood swings and so forth in high doses, which are toxic. But low-dose lithium orotate is different from what's prescribed by doctors, and it's also in the healthy dose. So that can just taking that can help calm the brain from looping because the brain will tend to loop when we're under stress and you worry more or you fixate on problems rather than being happy and fulfilled and more loving. So these are, you know, this is only one of many of the important suggestions that I make in my new book. And it's important that we realize that, that we don't have to take drugs to change our state. We just need to do things that we enjoy doing and make sure we're getting the proper nutrition and we can come back into balance. Thank you, John, for mentioning that. And I just want to also let all of our listeners know that there's a wealth of information and resources that you and your lovely daughter, Lauren, put together on MarsVenus.com every day with John Gray and all kinds of wonderful resources. So there's so much that we could discuss here today, and I thank you so much for being so generous with your time and with your wisdom. And I'm sure you'll all want to continue to get more from John. So please do visit MarsVenus.com. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I will put in the, the mention that you'll get a lot more from my daughter Lauren's uh, video blog. She puts them out every week, and they're actually better than what I do. It's like a, a step beyond, and she focuses particularly on women's needs as well. So I'll just put that plug in since I'm her dad. <laughs> yeah, really you must them. be very proud. I'm very proud. She's taken it to a whole other level because I could only really do it from the male perspective, even though I would I understand women quite well. But it was she being a woman. She says, "No, Dad, you got to say it like this." So she she's improved on me quite a bit. Thank you, John. And I'd just like to give you the opportunity before we close out, just to leave with maybe just one last parting thought. Well, a parting thought is to know that if you make a few changes 
And I think we've co- covered a lot of areas where you go, oh, I was doing that, and now I can make a change. That can give us hope in getting a better result. Because if we keep doing the same thing, we tend to get the same results. And by making a few changes, and, and most of those changes have to do with actually doing less and being yourself more. Working less hard and enjoying your life more becomes the fertile ground to attract the right person in your life and to allow that dream to come true of sharing your life with someone who loves you and someone that you can love. And we all deserve it. And I look forward to you having it as well. Thank you, John. I really appreciate your time and your generosity with your wisdom. And both John and I thank you so much for being here with us today. So we're sending you much love, many blessings, and wishing you happiness as you get ready for your right guy. Bye-bye for now. 